pretty eyes, pretty thighs, shawty she a dime, demon girl, evil eyes, she be telling lies. Uh, today is my pleasure to interview Dr. Sean Wu, the Associate Professor of Medicine at the Stanford School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Wu, so thank you for being part of this episode. With such a successful career, can we start with you taking us back and telling us about your educational background? Yeah, sure. So I uh, started out, actually was born in Taiwan, and I mm -hmm. went through uh, my primary school there until when I came to the U.S. Uh, around uh, sixth grade. So I went through my middle school um, and high school um, here in the U.S. I was in San Diego through my high school mm -hmm. years until I uh, became an undergrad um, at Stanford. So I, you know, it started out with my college in the Bay Area here and, you know, was a mechanical engineering major as well as a biology uh, major. Um, at the time, I was interested in working on biomechanics. So this is the beginning of the era of biomedical engineering, but at the time it was quite early. So there was no department just yet anywhere in the country, but I worked on biomechanics in order to try to go into um, uh, being a physician scientist. And I was thinking at the time about becoming a surgeon, like an orthopedic surgeon who usually are involved with, you know, people um, with bone disease and the biomechanics relate to the orthopedics quite a bit. Um, but of course, things, you know, come up in life and changes things. So when I went to medical school, and this was at Duke University after I finished Stanford, on a uh, MD and PhD combined degree training um, at Duke, I um, came up on cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular medicine, you know, which was a very big um, aspect of the disease patient population there in the South at, in North Carolina. And I then became very, very interested in all of the new technologies that were happening. You know, so I left the idea of being an orthopedic surgeon and, and went into becoming a cardiologist. And then so what, at Duke, I continue my training um, in the vascular biology that relates to the cardiovascular medicine for my PhD. And then I finished my medical school and started internal medicine residency after that, um, and then moved to Boston um, to start my cardiology fellowship. Um, and in Boston is um, where I started learning about uh, the research work on heart development. So as a cardiologist, one aspect of our learning is to try to understand children with congenital heart disease. And so because of the interest in wanting to know about congenital heart disease, I went to Boston Children's Hospital and did a research fellowship there um, at Boston Children. And that's when I first started my interest in working on the genes and pathways that are important for heart development in my fellowship at Boston Children before then finishing that and start my own research lab at Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, and so that began my faculty career at Massachusetts General Hospital um, at the time. So we were um, working on the heart development when I first started my research lab at Mass General. And three years after um, I became assistant professor, I had the opportunity um, to be recruited back to Stanford um, to continue my research work in heart development. And also because we were using stem cell as a research tool and model system to understand heart development. And California at the time had the, a major interest because of the funding from the uh, CERN, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, you know, from the Prop um, 77 uh, at the time, that attracted me to come to work on stem cell research in California as there are many others, you know, here in California that also works on. So my lab move in 2012 um, came to Stanford we continue to work on heart development and using stem cell as our model system and collaborate with other people, you know, who are here at Stanford. And so from the beginning days of working on heart development and then using stem cells as the model system, especially induced pluripotent stem cell cell um, that was discovered some years ago by Shinya Yamanaka in Japan. Um, we use the iPSL as a way to 
do modeling of heart diseases in the dish um, as one aspect of my research lab. And then relatively more recently, we've also continued um, along the engineering tissue line, you know, so reconnecting back from the days when I was an undergrad here in bioengineering, we started collaborating with bioengineers using the stem cell that we generate that become cardiac cell. And then those cardiac cell from stem cell gets put into engineer construct to make 3D engineer tissues. And then, so that's basically now what's going on with my research lab. We have a third of the lab works on heart development. We have a third of the lab that does disease model of cardiac disease with IPS stem cell. And then we have a third of the lab that looks at application of stem cell like tissue engineering to make engineer constructs for regenerative application in the heart. And uh, so you talked about how you're fascinated in like cardiology and cardiovascular science. So I was asked, what was so fascinating to become interested in cardiology? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the cardiovascular part came into it at the time when I was at medical school at Duke and in the South, there was a large population of patients who were having heart disease, um, a lot of heart attacks, a lot of heart rhythm disorder from their heart attacks. Um, the South being an area where, you know, obesity is very, very common um, and all the heart disease that happen from people with obesity and high blood pressures you know, when you see how many people and families that are affected by this condition, it naturally makes you want to contribute to how to fight the disease in some way. So that's one reason for having, you know, moved into cardiovascular disease at the time because of how prevalent it is occurring in the population. Mm -hmm. But the other reason also coincided with, at the time when I was at Duke, doing medical school, mm -hmm. new technology was coming in very, very rapidly in cardiovascular field. You know, right now, many things we are using to treat patients, um, angioplasty, stenting, we're putting mechanical support device for the heart. A lot of the work that were coming out at the time when I was in medical school was all of these new technology and a lot of non or low invasive, you know, minimally invasive using catheter instead of opening up the chest or opening up the belly, you know, as a surgeon. And so part of my reason to move away from orthopedic as a surgery into cardiology and cardiovascular medicine was the fact that so many new treatments do not require opening up parts of the body. You can get into the parts by putting a catheter that goes through the artery or the vein and reach the organ inside the body with just the catheter, you know, very small straw, like, you know, um, you know, catheter, and then do all the manipulations you need to do for your treatment. And then you can bring out all of the catheter and the equipment and close the blood vessel part that you pull out. And the person would now be, you know, more or less ready and, you know, and recovering without all the wound from the surgery that takes a long time, you know, to stay in the hospital, you know, and all the complications and infection that happens with the open surgery. So that was one reason why I felt like the momentum in the future, you know, this is in the mid to late nineties, the momentum in the future is to do as many procedures in a minimally invasive way as possible. And so that attracted me also to go into cardiology. And uh, so I read from uh, your bio that you also work with uh, Stuart Orkin, a world-renowned uh, hematologist. Mm -hmm. So I know you are in cardiology, but I just want to ask you, how was it like working along with the world-famous scientists and like how did your work in hematology help you in your career in cardiology now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it definitely is something that, you know, when people look at where I've been training, it was a little bit of a puzzle why a cardiac training person go to a hematology oncology mm -hmm. lab because you know typically 
you would go to a cardiology lab if you were training to be cardiology. Mm -hmm. So there was two reasons why I ended up finding Stuart Orkin. Um, one was, and probably the more important reason is that he has had a very long history of training physician scientists to be successful as a you know, scientist um, in and having their own research lab. And we know and have been always you know, told by people that even more important than finding a research topic is to find the right mentor who has the track record history of training other people to do the things you wanted to do in the future. So I was drawn by Stuart Orkin partly because of that track record of him having successfully developed young scientists into being a successful professional scientist. Um, and then so as one reason, the other reason was that he had a part of his lab at the time that works on heart research, you know, so mm -hmm. as much as he was a hematology oncologist, there was a line of research that his lab was working on in heart development because of a specific molecule called a GATA transcription factor that had a, a particular heart regulation role that they were looking at. So I partly, you know, because of that interest in heart development in a smaller part of his lab, and also him being a good mentor, decided that that could be a good place for me to train um, what I wanted to do in heart development because he has you know, a line of research there. But in addition, he had done a lot of research on stem cell in creating the mouse model system of gene knockout in the mouse. So at the time, there are few people in the world who are really good at making these mouse that are missing specific gene that you wanted to know what it does. And so if you wanted to know how to do the same thing, you know, find a gene of interest, knock it out so it's absent in that animal, you have to go to a few of these labs that are very good in making mouse, you know, that way. And his lab was one of the lab that have done a lot of work in this area of creating knockout mouse. So I wanted to acquire the skill set also to have the ability to, you know, make decisions about what gene I want to take out in the mouse and see what happened to the heart after I take the gene out. So, you know, it was a combination of him being a good mentor, also has an interest in some cardiac development research, and has this very special skill set to work with the gene knockout, you know, mm -hmm. that I decided to train with him, you know, so, and also the gene knockout uses st embryonic stem cell, mouse mm. embryonic stem cell. So that's why I got into becoming a stem cell biologist is because the tool that they use to make the mouse, the embryonic stem cell was something that I wanted to learn how to work with. And then, so having worked with embryonic mouse stem cell allows me to move into later on other human based stem cell, you know, to do disease model. Mm -hmm. So uh, you also have your own medical practice and mm -hmm. you're also doing research now. I know, so my aunt is a psychologist, mm -hmm. probably different from a cardiologist, but you know, doctors are busy, you know, treating patients, but at the same time, you're a researcher. So I just want to ask, like, mm -hmm. do you think they, like, like, how are you able to like organize your time? Like, like, you know, wisely because you have to do research and also like see your patients mm -hmm. yeah so you know that's a great question that will have somewhat different answer from one person to the next mm -hmm. i think um but at the core probably for everyone is you have to be very organized in how to you know allocate your time and you have to be efficient you know, and multitask. So I think at the base of it, probably everyone who chooses to be a physician scientist, you know, have medical practice on one hand, do research on the other hand, and run a research lab requires you to be, you know, very efficient and very organized. Um, but I think the bigger barrier for people to be in this position, though, is the training that it would take in order to become a physician scientist personally. So it normally takes about 10 years of training 
for the medical side, Mm -hmm. you know, for four years of medical school, and then plus another four or five of, you know, internship, residency, and the fellowship. And Mm -hmm. so you spend about 10 to train to be a practitioner in medicine. And for the research, you usually also need about four or five years of your PhD training, sometimes more. And then if you wanted to professionally do research as a, you know, a lab investigator, uh, you then do a postdoctoral research and that can range anywhere from one or two years to five or seven years. So if you are doing that in biomedical research, it's usually four or five, again, you know, maybe longer. So you're adding another 10 years. So for someone who is going to end up doing what I do, part of my time is, you know, seeing patients, a much smaller, about 15% of my time is seeing patient, but much bigger amount of time, 85% is running my research lab. Mm-hmm. To do this, you have to train probably for about 20 years from graduating college. So that part I think is where much fewer number of people willing to sign on, you know, 20 years of their life to do nothing but train in two different area. And there are many people during the time or even before I you know, started this training, have always asked me like, why do you want to do the job of two people? You know, a fair question, right? Of course, you know, for most people, the entire career is to do the job of one of these, you know, either a physician or a scientist. And my answer to that is always the role of the physician scientist is very unique. It's essentially serving as a translator, if you think of it in languages, it, you are the translator between the people who are treating patient clinically and the people who are doing research in the lab. And your role as a translator is to bring the science that's being worked on in the research lab and find a way to move it forward to allow it to be used to treat people who are in the hospital. And people who do this you know, well should have the skill set to communicate with both the people who are doing the science and with people who are treating the patients in order to really know what is the need from the clinical side and what are the tools and the technology that have been developed on the basic and translational research side. So I think for the physician scientist is serving this very unique juncture to facilitate the translating of basic translational research into a clinical and patient care. And it's an extremely gratifying role, I think, at least for me, seeing something can really help treat people with a knee that previously have no treatments available, you know, is very exciting that you potentially might save someone, you know, from dying because of what you are able to help bring, you know, to be available for treating them. So your laboratory was among the earliest labs in the country to engage single cell biology using novel single cell tools as they became available. So at that time, like, like when you were going to do this, like what potential did you see in using a novel uh, single cell tools in engaging single cell biology? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now that's again, another fantastic question. You know, this is the kinds of question that people who are postdoctoral fellow. You know, mm-hmm. already having gotten their PhD degree, off, often ask me when I give talks in universities around the country, you know, so you're quite advanced in your years in mm-hmm. recognizing, you know, this particular, uh, you know, interesting s- scenario. So what I, you know, usually, you know, reflect on why we ended up getting into single cell at the time we got into it is mostly about the need and the scientific question that we are trying to answer, you know, and what the need we have to answer the question. So we did not come to single cell at the time with the idea that this looks like the next, you know, best, next, you know, best thing that's going to happen in research. And we need to jump on it because that's how exciting this thing looks, you know, it's hard to read crystal ball, basically, you know, to know what is going to be the big thing. But what we knew that we have to have in order to answer the question of the science is that we were trying to know 
if you have one single stem cell or a progenitor cell, which is supposed to have the ability to differentiate and make two or three different kinds of cells, that one cell, you know, when it differentiate, which usually also divide, you know, one cell become two cell, two cell become four cells and, and so on. By the time it finally finishes that differentiation and have say 20 cells that you have, what exactly are the cells that you have made from that original single stem cell in that 20 at the end, all the daughter cells? There was no tool at the time for us to know if that one cell made 20 very sort of, you know, middle of the row, not differentiated daughter cells and expresses different genes of all these different cell type, or did the one cell became 20 different kinds of, or, you know, three different kinds of cells, you know, seven of one, eight of the other, five of the third, right? So there was no tool to, identified individually whether the daughter cell from that one stem cell are unique cells with its own characteristic individually or all kind of middle undifferentiated or sort of undefined combination of multiple different cell type. So that need require us to have the ability to assess each individual daughter cell for what they are and how strong of a cell phenotype that each cell has acquired of that particular cell type. You know, so starting with that, we worked on to understand what tools available to address the question of what are these individual daughter cells when we differentiate a single stem cell. And then as we worked on that, the only tool available was a, a multiplex a qPCR method. So you have to identify what the genes you wanted to measure. And then the tool available allows you to measure say 48 genes or 96 genes at a single time for you to figure out. So that's the precursor days of the RNA-seq. And then very shortly after when the single cell RNA-seq tool became available. So instead of identifying what gene you want, it just measures all the genes in that single cell. We very quickly brought that along because we, at that point, you know, found out how powerful by doing the single cell on our stem cell system and realized how powerful that single cell capacity really represents. We then right away continue and picked up the RNA-seq part. And then so that work, which we published back in 2016, was coming out at a time when most people are not really sure, do we want to get into single cell at all, you know, in 2016. Because again, there was only a handful of paper that were published. We were the first cardiac paper that was published on single cell RNA-seq. So, you know, most people, when they see the very first paper, you know, they always usually wonder like, oh, that sounds interesting, but you know, is this going to be like a big thing that anybody else going to want to use it? You know, is it worth getting into it? Because if it's very expensive or very hard to learn how to do this. Maybe it's not worth doing it because two years later, nobody else is doing it anyway. So why spend all this energy learning now just to then have to switch and learn something else, right? So, so back then, 2016, we nor anyone else really know for sure how big of a deal single cell RNA-C might necessarily be. But then as it, you know, turned out, as more people use it and work with it and see how powerful the tool really is, and more and more people started getting into it, you see this explosion of papers that have come out on single cell RNA-seq to the point where now I think when you publish something and you don't use single cell RNA-seq, you use what's called bulk RNA-seq, you know, where all the cells are completely, you know, dissolve into one big mix. So you don't know who is who. Um, your reviewer now often criticize saying, oh, you really should work on single cell RNA-seq mm -hmm. to see each individual cell as they are rather than see the, um, you know, the combination of all the cells in one big mix. You know, I wanna sort of quote someone. This is a, a, a medical student who um, has been working in the, the Simon lab in Boston, John and Cricket Simon. And you know, uh, this medical student, Emily 
Nadelman had a great analogy for what the difference is between bulk RNA-seq and single cell RNA-seq. And she describes it as a bulk RNA-seq is a smoothie. All the fruits are ground up in a mix mm -hmm. where a single cell RNA-seq is a fruit salad where every single fruit is individually separated. So, you know, if you think of that as a yeah. picture, that's the difference between doing single cell RNA-seq, the fruit salad, or the bulk RNA-seq, the smoothie. You know, so, you know, realizing how important it is to distinguish individual cell, you know, it, I think now has become almost the gold standard for gene expression analysis in almost everything in biology. Um, because of how important to know whether or not, you know, you're dealing with a fruit salad and all the fruits in it versus just a smoothie where you can't really say what it mm. is that you're taking. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually pretty interesting. I kind of like the analogy, you know, I, in a way for someone that's not in the profession, it, I guess in a way it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So my next question is, uh, it's, it's like, why do you become interested in developing like a heart expression atlas in order to identify the cell type development stage and like the anatomical location of each single cardiac cell during the mouse heart development atlas sequence? Because I know creating an atlas is really a big project. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. So, you know, there are efforts to catalog all the various different types mm -hmm. of cells, you know, in the human body, in the mouse. That effort, I think, is important in the same way when people first started out doing human genome sequencing, you know, where they sequence the DNA in order to have a blueprint that represent how all of human and their gene sequences generally look. Because when you do that and you have a reference, now you can see differences from the reference. So genes that are mutated in people who have disease versus genes that are you know, not mutated relative to the general population, because that work with the human genome sequence sets up what now is these studies called genome-wide association studies, where people are able to identify new disease-causing or disease-associated genes to try to understand what exactly is the role of these genes. You know, so that has been a huge explosion in the genome world. If you think about that and try to now think of how that relates to the human cell atlas project or the mouse cell atlas project, it's an effort to catalog what are all the different normal cell types that are within the body. So you have that reference of what normal means in cell and their cell behavior, cell gene expression, you know, and also more and more data on cell epigenetics you know, and so on, and proteomics and metabolomic all in single cell, you know, with all the distinct individual cell states. With that being the reference map, now you can go and look at disease people and say, okay, what happens in a disease and what cell is the beginner of a disease process when you map and compare those cells with what the reference is in the normal. And then so, you know, what's gonna happen in the future is that we would have this reference of normal expression and normal epigenetics to use when we find some cell population that could represent the beginning of disease. We can say, look, these cell looks like they are abnormal when you compare against the normal reference. And we would then be able to focus on how exactly these abnormal cells begin the process of being abnormal. Is there some parts that would regulate the formation of those cells that may become a target for treating and preventing of a certain disease? You know, so to be able to identify these things, not as a gene that's different in the genome, but now as cells that's different in the cell atlas. So, yeah, that's actually pretty interesting. Um, because you know, so I'm not sure this is correct, but it sounds similar to like the human genome project or something. It, it sounds similar because they're both creating atlases and like trying to identify what mm -hmm. like everything inside a human body. So my next question is uh it's about myocarditis and like how do you address the pathogenic immune response in patients with myocarditis? 
from the treatment with the immune checkpoint um, um, inhibitors, the ICIS for cancer therapy using single cell um, immunology tools from 10X uh, genomics. Mm -hmm. Genomics. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, Greg, you know, that you picked up on the work we have um, mm -hmm. been looking at with this a very unique aspect of um, cancer treatment. So immune checkpoint inhibitor for people who may not necessarily, you know, have come across or familiar with um, are drugs that are targeting the immune system to try to rev up and activate our own body's immune system to mm -hmm. attack against cancer cells. Okay. So the checkpoint inhibitor, meaning immune cells we have in the body are usually being suppressed or checked, you know, from expanding and attacking because we don't want it to attack us when we're not having any issue because that become a disease, an autoimmune disease itself. But when a patient has cancer, those cancer cells tend to have something different about them from the normal cell that the immune system can recognize and attack. But they usually don't attack them as readily because our body has these checkpoint molecule to shut it down. And so the immune checkpoint inhibitors will prevent those checkpoint to rev up the immune system who will then go to the cancer and attack them. So that's the basis for how the checkpoint inhibitors are working. So you probably even see a lot of TV commercial for drugs like Kichuda. That's one version of the checkpoint inhibitor mm -hmm. that you'll be, you know, hear a lot on TV in commercials. So these checkpoint inhibitors, you know, because they rev up your immune system to fight the cancer, it's not always possible to only rev up the immune cell that target cancer alone. You will rev up immune cell that may also start attacking normal cells otherwise in the other parts of the body. So in a relatively small frequency, about 1% of the people getting the immune checkpoint inhibitor end up having inflammation in the heart, myocarditis. And so what we wanted to understand about the process of this immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis is what exactly causes those immune cells to turn around and attack the heart instead of trying to fight the cancers. And within that, there are many different questions. It's a brand new research area. There are many in people interested trying to understand it. One very simple question is, are the cells that attack the cancer cell the same cell that's attacking the heart cell? Because we don't really know that. You know, it may be that the immune system is activated so that some cell that recognizes the cancer attacks cancer, but other cells that recognize the heart is attacking heart, meaning they're just different cells that is being activated by different, you know, molecule in the body. But it could be the same molecule if, for whatever reason, the cancer expresses certain molecule that is being recognized by the immune cell, but that immune cell also see the same molecule existing in the heart and attacks that also. So we don't know what particular path that the immune cells are taking when they attack the heart. Is it because they are recognize something special with the muscle cells in the heart, or is it because they have a share molecule between the cancer cells? That's what's being attacked. So that's what we're trying to do. And the single cell technology gets brought into it because we need to know exactly what immune cells are the ones that are doing the attacking. You know, there are millions and millions of immune cells that are sitting around circulating all the time and trying to find, you know, offending agents like bacteria, viruses to attack. We don't know which one of those immune cells is actually doing the attacking. And the only way to really get at that is using these powerful single cell tool to identify what cells are expanding inside the person's heart when they are having the myocarditis, what exactly is the protein that these expanding immune cells are recognizing in order to attack you know, the heart with it. And then also, you know, is there some signaling pathway, you know, genes that are 
needed to expand these immune cells for them to grow into a much bigger and stronger fighting force? Are there molecules that are needed to make them into such strong fighting force of immune cell that we can block so that they don't get into becoming such a strong immune cell and fight against our own heart rather than fight against the cancer. So those are all the things that we're trying to do, you know, with this uh, single cell technology and looking at the cell population and looking at the genes that regulates them. Yeah. And uh, I have a question regarding my myocarditis. It's not really regarding the uh, immune checkpoints, but uh, a few months ago, uh, I believe, or scientists, they found that like COVID-19 causes myocarditis for some teenagers. So mm-hmm. you're a cardiologist. So do you have any, like, do, like, what do you have to say regarding this like weird scenario that's been going on, especially with the COVID vaccines? And I know it seems like you're Dr. Rossi or good friends or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, definitely, and it's a great question you brought up about the COVID myocarditis, and I'll also put that together with the um, vaccine myocarditis. Because those are two scenarios that have been talked about recently with myocarditis. So first, when you have any kinds of immune responses, there is likelihood that there's some cross reactivity in the heart to cause myocarditis. Mm -hmm. So we know, and there are many different viral myocarditis that have been happening all the time. You know, Mm -hmm. so myocarditis and viruses have a long history with each other. And then, so we know that for whatever reason, you know, depending on the virus, some viruses attack cells in the heart. So you get myocarditis. Some viruses don't attack cells in the heart, but you still get myocarditis anyway because of some cross-reacting event between the immune cell. When people look at the COVID virus so far, it does not appear that the COVID virus themselves grow that much within the heart. People Mm -hmm. do find it occasionally, but it's not a major organ for the virus to keep growing and growing and growing, you know, unlike the way some other viruses that loves to grow when you infect, you know, with the virus. So we know the virus is not in the heart very much. So it's not the major driver. But what we do know is that inflammation, when that happens with almost any inflammation, but viruses, you know, particularly, causes this cross reactivity for the immune cell to come into the heart and start inflame and activate. It's extremely low frequency. So you see, you know, people talk about when COVID has a myocarditis, you know, some percentages, but again, very low, probably less than 1%, much less than 1%, you know, who have true myocarditis, they have a lot of muscle dysfunction in the heart, but, and even sometimes muscle damage, but those are not happening from an inflammation and myocarditis, okay? So myocarditis, low frequency in COVID infection, even lower, much, much lower in in vaccine triggered myocarditis. So the frequency as it's been reported more recently is maybe somewhere in the 10 people in a million with vaccine who may have myocarditis, The interesting part is that they generally affect younger people. So young and male, there's some predominance in male with myocarditis. So younger male are the ones that have more likelihood to develop myocarditis um, and the frequency goes down as you get older. You know, so that's been what has been discussed in the news. Um, And those myocarditis, of course, involve immune cells. So very similar to the the immune checkpoint myocarditis involving immune cells. But fortunately, the myocarditis from COVID vaccine is very mild and generally self-limiting. You know, you don't see the kinds of death rate. For example, as a comparison, immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis, almost half of the people have found to die when you are having a full on myocarditis from immune checkpoint inhibitor. We have not heard of death rates in people with vaccine myocarditis. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not sure really there's even a good number for a COVID myocarditis if you got virus infection itself. So again, that speaks to how different the frequency 
that you get myocarditis between checkpoint inhibitor, you know, a lot more severe on the order of 1%, COVID infection, something much less than 1%, and vaccine, very, very, very rare, like 10, 20 people out of a million who receives the vaccine. Mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of the frequency and what the relationship mm -hmm. that people should think about. And for your, and you also start incorporating biocomputing in your work and which is AI. So in 10 years or let's say in a decade, 10 years or maybe 20 years, how do you see AI and biotech just working together? Yeah, I would probably say it's not even 10, 20 years. I would say AI biotechs are already working together. And the way that they work together is going to evolve over time. Um, it's not always easy, you know, again, trying to read a crystal ball on how the evolution between AI and biotech is a little more challenging. Um, but what we, at least now, like what we're doing, what other people are doing is to start incorporating a lot more AI technology in data analysis. You know, where the biggest difference that AI has now had an influence is how to analyze large, large data sets that before we just don't have any tool available to understand what all the data is telling us in the data set. You know, for us, it was about the single cell RNA seq. You know, we have been working on a project which we're now, you know, going through the paper submission and review process of using AI to interpret what the single cell data tells us about each single cell and what they are, like what type they are what stage of heart development they represent. And then in the future, whether that cell is a disease cell or not disease cell. You know? So you can envision maybe in the future, in order to know if somebody has a, you know, a disease, you can collect a blood sample or a heart sample and you run single cell profile and then you compare with the reference cell profile and you say, ah, look, I think you have a certain proportion of your cell that are diseased because of the single cell, in, you know, and to do that is going to probably need you to have uh, some AI input in the uh, understanding of the cell profile and the interpretation, you know, so I think those are the possibility for a few ways that the AI, you know, might come into the biotech you know, biosciences, at least, you know, the biotech world, when it comes to health tech, so a somewhat different dimension, health tech are things like your wearables, you know, monitoring your heart rate, monitoring mm -hmm. your blood pressure, monitoring your sweat, all these health tech devices, many are already enabled by AI, meaning they need to detect the pattern with an algorithm that would determine whether it's normal or it's abnormal. So many of these things, I think the AI has already now come in to be the interpreter of the data information that's generated in real time. So I wouldn't be surprised that some, you know, years in the future, you know, we're all monitor continuously in some watch, in some, you know, patch, whatever else, we'd be wearing a clothing which has some sensor and is submitting information about our body temperature, you know, and whatnot. And all of that is being fed into some AI algorithm in the background, trying to tabulate if we're in the process of having an infection coming up based on the changes in our mm -hmm. heart rate and our blood pressures and whatnot. You also incorporate uh, the food giant based multiplex single cell PCR thing. We're talking about that as an HD biomarker to analyze the differentiation of a single cardiac uh, progenitor cells in vitro. So there's this expression called the NKX 2.5. So, why does this expression like mark a subpopulation of committed endocardial uh, precursor cells in the mouse heart? Yeah, so uh, you're bringing up about a very specific process of heart development that mm -hmm. we have looked at. So during early stage heart development, there are a few key genes that drive the formation of all the rest of the cells in the heart. You know, so at that very beginning stage, heart progenitor represents a very small number of all the cells in the heart, but those progenitor expressing a gene like NKX 2.5 are already bound to become a heart forming cell because of their expression of that NKX 2.5 gene. 
And the NKX 2.5 is what's called a transcription factor, which means that it drives the, for the expression of other genes in that cell. So as it happened, because NKX is a fairly heart specific transcription factor, it will drive the expression of many other genes in the cell to become a heart cell. You know, there are many other transcription factor also that have similar purpose, but they kind of work together with each other in that feedback network to drive each other to express higher levels and to drive other gene downstream to express in higher level, all for the sake of eventually creating a cell that expresses the right set of gene for making a heart cell. So that's sort of the way the NKX has been interpreted so far. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of other new discovery that will happen for how NKX regulates the heart formation. But as it stands, I think the most generally recognized role is that it can drive the expression of other heart specific gene to make the heart cell become more definitive, you know, in development. So you also isolated the earliest committed heart precursor cell is called a master heart stem cell. And it can also give rise to all major cell types in the developing heart. So I just want to ask you, like, how were you, how was your lab able to isolate this stem cell particularly? And, uh, and, uh, and how are you going to see it like in the market, like in the, you know, the, the mar in the medical market in the foreseeable future? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so, you know, this sort of takes me back to the days when I was in Boston children, you know, mm -hmm. so the work started when I was a, uh, you know, research fellow in Stuart Orkin's lab. Mm -hmm. One of the advantage of having spent my time training in a hematology research lab is that the blood cell is very hierarchical structured in this way, meaning you start with the blood stem cell, but one blood stem cell can make multiple blood progenitor cells and each blood progenitor makes multiple daughter cell of the blood progenitor into red blood cells or you know, t in the T cells, you know, T lymphocytes, B lymphocytes and macrophages and neutrophil. So the blood is a very, very, well described and a beautiful biological system for this process of a stem cell differentiation into all the daughter cells. When I started working in the lab, the heart was not really thought in the same way. People talk about the heart being developed from different fields, you know, so many, many cell in a field and those many cells then build the heart in various ways. Some make the muscles, some make the blood vessels, some make the fibroblasts, the connected tissue. So people do not think the heart have a relationship this way of a hierarchy from a stem progenitor into a daughter cell, into more daughter cell, and with capacity to differentiate to more than just one kind of cell, You know, meaning a precursor for the cardiac muscle cell will only make muscle, a precursor for the cardiac vessel, blood vessel will make blood vessel, but nothing else. And what we did when we studied this NKX gene as a marker is that we found that the progenitor, you know, stem progenitor cell with the expression of NKX can make more than just the heart muscles. It can also make the smooth muscle, which is a vascular cell and other people have found that there's even cell that the NKX progenitor make that are endocardio or it, you know, they're vascular cell, endothelial vascular cell. So in fact, our paper was able to show that the heart is also like the blood in having these precursor with multiple potency for differentiating into different types of cell. So we're not so different from the blood system in having a stem progenitor and their differentiated progeny daughter cells. You know, so that was the sort of the major conceptual new information we brought in at the time for this heart stem progenitor cell. Um, and your question then the next was, well, what do you do with the cell and how can you use it in some application in therapy? 
And so in terms of how to use it, I would say right now, the more sort of accessible aspect of a stem cell is to try to use it to model disease of what's going on using IPS in a dish. You know, so if you can identify the stem cell and study their differentiation, you can see whether or not development problem in children like ones with a congenital heart disease shows that congenital defect in the dish when you do the disease model. That's the more easier uses, you know, and we can then try to discover new drugs or treatments that would prevent that progression of disease in the dish as a way of finding potential new treatment. But the sort of bigger target, more challenging, um, but very um, much the interest of many people is to take that progenitor stem cell and use it to treat patients directly with the cells that you make. We know that in the adults, you know, many, many people develop heart attacks. So they lose muscle cells in the heart. And once those muscle cells are gone, there's no other way to get them back. Okay? Because our own heart, unfortunately, do not know how to repair and regenerate itself. You know, unlike other species like the zebra fish, as an example, regenerate the heart muscle cells when it's damaged or a salamander, you can injure the salamander and it would regrow back the heart as well, you know, as the limbs, for example, it, you know, so some species retain the ability to regenerate their lost muscle tissue, like regenerating liver, but the human and mice unfortunately don't. And so in order to repair and bring into the muscle wall new muscles that it cannot make itself. Many people want to use the stem cell tool like IPS progenitor or IPS cardiomyocyte, the differentiated cells from the progenitor, and inject those cells back into the heart of the patient who have lost those muscles as a way to you know, rebuild some of the lost muscle tissue after having heart attack. So again, as I said, that's a much bigger target and the longer term effort because it's gonna take quite a lot of understanding of how to rebuild the muscle wall. And I think beyond just injecting the cells into the heart to see what would happen, because many people have tried to inject things into the heart and it has not really looked very interesting you know, so far. So I think injecting the stem cell derived muscle may help a little, it may not help, it's unclear at the moment, but I do think that even if it does help a little after you inject, it's still going to require a lot more things for it to build itself into a wall with the forces of contracting that you would expect for the muscle wall to do, you know, in real life. So I think we got a long way to go to make that part work out. So you talked about you like made a mini heart of bean dish. So, uh, I, before you, a few episodes ago, uh, uh, I interviewed someone else, Dr. Gopal Krishnan. He made a mini brain in the dish. So this is interesting. Uh, so I'm just wondering, like, how are you able to just make a heart in the dish? Because it's, it's like, because because I'm just fascinated by this, like, new technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so in terms of making a beating heart muscle cell, which is what we do every day, and many people in my lab works on making beating heart muscle, you know, when you see them beating away in the dish under the microscope, it's, you know, extremely exciting. It took more than, you know, 10 years for people to really know how to make that process work efficiently. You know, at the beginning, you only make 1% or 2% of those cells cardiac. So it's a very small number. Now, most people are able to get 90 to 95% of the cells being beating cardiac muscle. So it's an incredible accomplishment in the field for people to have being able to get to this point. Um, and then with the ability to make large number of these beating heart muscles, you can envision now, if you put that into engineer construct or 3D bioprinting, which is something that we've been working with, inject the cells into the shape and the mold of what you want and create that 3D tissue incorporating the muscle beating cell, 
you can now start create structures, you know, hopefully more interesting than just the organoid in the small spherical shape, but you can make walls or, you know, slabs and you can make whatever you want with a 3D printing. And that's the kinds of things that we and others are working on to be able to create. And hopefully one of these will work out, you know, nicely into a therapy that we can put it in as a, you know, treatment in patients in, you know, in the future. And uh, you also, so you, you're all, we all talk about tissue engineering, uh, your team's trying to make a true functioning heart. So that looks, uh, that, so let's say like, you know, you finally like is this in the future, you finally figure out how to make a true functioning heart. So is this going to make heart transplants easier and cheaper? Cause I know they're pretty expensive mm-hmm. and, you know, America does have some healthcare problems. Yeah, so yeah. is this going to lower the cost or is it still going to be the same? Well, so I think what the intention is that in people who eventually end up having to have a transplant, mm-hmm. if you can put the muscle cell back and recreate the wall, maybe that prevent them from getting worse so that they don't need to be transplanted. You know, mm-hmm. so, oh. you know, rather than addressing how to have more transplantable organ, which we know is very hard to come by, you know, there's only about 2000 or so transplant that could get done in a year because of the limit number of organs that are available. Maybe you can reduce the number of people needing it. So there's 200,000, say, people who are waiting to have a transplanted heart. Maybe if you can treat those people with the engineer heart muscle so that their heart can recover and be able to function better and not continue to get worse, the number who needs a transplanted heart could go down to 100,000 a year or 50,000, you know, so some number much less than right now when there's so many people who are waiting and many die in the process of waiting and can't get a transplanted heart. So I think that's sort of a more of what we're thinking of what this uh, new technology of engineered tissue would really be trying to do, you know, not so much of replacing the transplant itself, um, but really reducing the need for transplant if that was possible from the engineered tissue and uh, you also found a transcription factor called a yin yang over the while i won the yin yang one uh, <laughs> and it's you figure out that the embryo fails to form a heart when there isn't that factor so i just want to ask i believe the yin yang is, is some chinese symbol so uh, why do you name this transcription factor after the yin yang mm-hmm yeah. Well, so, you know, the, the name yin yang for this molecule came about because it has very distinct role in different situations. So, you know, in one situation, it's meant to be, you know, blocking something from happening. In the other situation, it is meant to promote the exact same thing that it blocks in another situation. So that's why you know, when scientists discover the molecule, they gave it this yin yang, you know, yin and yang in Chinese, because it has this diposing role, you know, in the body, all based on what is the situation that the molecule is being used for. And then so in our case, when we study this gene in the heart, earlier study that had been published before us said this molecule inhibits the expression of heart muscle genes. So the idea for most people have been, this is a inhibitor of heart formation. But when we study it, we found that if you delete this molecule, you know, take it out of the mouse development, we actually see no formation of the heart. And then what that means is that this molecule is actually required or promoting the formation of the heart. Right, so complete opposite from what people before had said as a molecule that inhibits the expression of muscle genes of the heart, right? So it seems to be very interesting in the way that depending on what the situation and when you are looking at it in the spectrum of heart development, it served as a promoter of heart formation in one situation, and it served as an inhibitor of heart formation in another situation. So that yin yang aspect of it. So, you know, so when we found out the, you know, the yang aspect from the yin yang aspect that people have found about this gene before, it was pretty exciting because we now at least have a, a sort of a master molecule that we know is necessary to make all these heart cells at the very beginning step of heart formation. 
with yin yang. Yeah. So uh, as a cardiologist, uh, what are some ways to prevent a heart attack? Oh, there are many, many things for sure that you could do for preventing heart attacks. Um, I would say that the things that every one of us definitely could do a lot more is regular exercise. You know, I mm -hmm. think we have a very sedentary population in the country, yep. and too much obesity, you know, yeah. so there are too much office sitting. So there's not enough physical exercise. So, you know, for, as a cardiologist, you know, my sort of biggest recommendation for everyone is always to make sure everyone maintain regular exercises, at least 40, 45 minutes, at least three times a week of moderate intensity, get your heart rate up into 70% of your maximal age heart rate, you know, and achieve that at least three times a week. So exercise, I think, is the biggest preventive factor. Um, but, you know, of course, other things like making sure your blood pressure is managed and maintained so that it's not too high, making sure your cholesterol level is regularly checked and not too high. You know, so all these things are some of the, the biggest way and not smoking. And that's, again, another big factor. So as a cardiologist, these are the kinds of things we always discuss with our patients in clinic about how to best reduce your chances of ever developing heart disease. But, you know, I feel like we're really sometimes speaking to not necessarily the best audience when we talk to the patient who already have heart disease when they come to us, meaning we really need to be talking to people who haven't had heart disease, right? Mm -hmm. At the very early stages of their life, making sure that they know these are the important things so that they can manage and maintain their entire life of healthy living and healthy living style. So they don't ever have to come and see me as a cardiologist in clinic, you know, so these would be the kinds of recommendation I would definitely say to you and also everyone else is that, you know, making sure that you don't smoke, watch your blood pressure, lower your cholesterol and exercise regularly. Mm -hmm. So what is the future of the biology and the biotech field? Um, biology, biotech in which area, or you just kind like, of any, like just generally. Hmm. Yeah, well, I, I think there are definitely lots of interesting, exciting things, you know, again, you know, trying to read crystal balls are not always, you know, so easy. Uh, the most immediate horizon, I would say, is definitely trying to do gene correction editing, meaning mm -hmm. all the things you see people, you know, who are trying with the CRISPR, you know, technology. Um, I, I'm assuming you're familiar with the CRISPR yes. technology. Yeah. So editing our genome for the purpose of correcting some disease process. Um, and of course, there's a big spectrum of diseases and gene relationship that people will have to really understand to know which one makes the most sense to use CRISPR. But I do think that in the horizon, a big push has been to try to figure out, can we go into certain organ, target the gene mutation or variations and correct or modify it and see do that end up coming out with a new outcome. So many biotech companies are working in this direction and finding genes that are responsible or is susceptible and using tools like CRISPR to make modifications on them. Mm -hmm. So you've done so many projects and, and research. Uh, what is your favorite research you've done or are currently doing? Wow, favorite research. Um, I, I, you know, there's been, you know, lots and lots of really interesting and exciting, you know, things that I think we have been involved in some of it, you know, other we just observe and watch and see, you know, that people have, um, have done um, in terms of, you know, things that we've been working on, you know, I probably would say, um, you know, the, the single cell certainly it ranks quite up there with some of the most exciting work that we've been doing, you know, just because I think we came into it so early and we were able to take advantage of using it to find new discovery with it, you know, much earlier than many people have. So I think the single cell certainly have been one of the highlights, you know, from the years of doing mm -hmm. research. Um, but, you know, there are lots of also really, really interesting science that other people have done. Like one example is a project that we um, collaborate with other colleagues um, in a disease called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this is a disease affecting a lot of young 
people, especially young athletes, you see a lot of people who die suddenly in the middle of exercise as a mm-hmm. young athlete, many of them have this condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where their muscle wall gets super thick, you know, and those thick muscle wall causes a lot of rhythm problems um, in mm-hmm. the individual. So in these people, some of the understanding of why they were developing it is due to the very unique molecule that causes muscle contraction called myosin, you know, so you may have learned in biology class, you know, our muscle, both the skeletal and the heart muscle works and contracts because of the myosin and the actin, where the myosin contracts on the actin to pull the muscle fiber together to generate force. So, you know, our colleague, um, Jim Spudich here at Stanford was one of the pioneer who really understood the relationship of how the myosin and the actin contracts. And they now, because of the understanding of the myosin actin relationship, were able to discover new drugs that prevent this excessive myosin actin activity that leads to this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this became basis of new company that was started here in the Bay Area called Myocardia. And this company, Myocardia, now is looking at some very interesting new drugs that they recently published, um, showing very good activity in reducing this uh, hypertrophic disease, um, you know, effects on patients. You know, so again, some very exciting line of work with this myosin actin biology, and now we're collaborating a little bit with a a major. Uh, research group um, to study how that myosin actin mutation is causing the rest of the heart muscle to become hypertrophic, you know, to develop the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, you know, again, uh, you know, one of these things that you uh, really get excited about and why you, you know, wake up in the morning and couldn't wait to get to the lab to find out what happened with the research experiment, you know, this is one of the line of research that I would, you know, certainly say, you know, has been that way for us. What advice do you receive during your career that shaped your professional development or success? Oh, what advice? There were definitely many advice that you get over the years based on what, you know, point you are, you know, in your training and development. But probably I would say the most important that I got is to, work on things that you find exciting and interesting to spend your time. Meaning don't waste your time working on things that you don't find exciting for some other reason or purpose, you know, or for somebody else's needs. Because, you know, in science, it's a very long route, as I explained, you know, as a physician scientist, certainly 20 years of training, but doing science itself, 10 years of training, it's a very long route and the career itself can get challenging from time to time. So if you're not doing that because of something you're extremely excited and passionate about, it will be very hard to continue to keep doing that when things get hard during this career of being a scientist. You know, so what the best advice that I got was to not just do something because it was convenient or easy, but not necessarily exciting you know, but do something where you really feel passionate about. And hopefully because of the passion and the hard work, something will come out from it that will continue to allow you to keep doing interesting science that you're passionate about, you know, which I think that has really remained true, you know, through my entire career. Is there uh, anything else that we didn't touch upon that we should tell our audience? Oh, hmm. I guess, um, I mean, I think you're doing some very interesting thing with this podcast. And so I, I'm certainly, you know, interested in knowing about, you know, what in the end, all these podcasts that you would hope to accomplish, you know, that people in the end could find, you know, interesting, um, you know, for them. So I'm somewhat turning the question over to you about, you know, this effort, because it sounds like this has been a passion for you um, to try to do, you know, and uh, I would love to see, you know, if in some way that, you know, the things that I and Derek and, you know, other people who have been on this podcast have been able to provide that you're able to turn this into something that would help everyone else in a big way. Yeah, because the reason why I did this was 
is because I there's just uh especially in like for kids basically we don't know what we want to do right so it's like one day we could be like yeah I want to be a computer engineer one day I want to be a doctor next day I'll be a lawyer so I mean for like high schoolers and teenagers especially I realized like no one has like just no one really understands what what the job occupation they have so it's not just uh does Dr. Ross he's not just Battlefield uh Vince Cerf the co-founder of the internet was on the podcast mm-hmm. so with thank like, you uh uh, Dr. Rossi, uh, Vince Cerf, uh, I'm just trying to like inform like teenagers about like specific career roles so they get more info about it. So when they want to choose like what, what like what do I want to major in? You know, they know like they at least know the background behind all of these different like careers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. I'm really glad that you're doing that because certainly when I was growing up in middle school and mm-hmm. high school, you know the podcast didn't exist, you know, we didn't even have, you know, cell phones, you yeah. know, right? so, you know, I think what you're now able to do is just so much more and better than what we've ever, you know, had in the past, so a lot of us have to find our way around and do the, you know, much more laborious of, you know, meeting people, you know, very inefficient to try to learn about mm-hmm. everything, So our choices are not nearly as abundant and our decision probably not nearly as good as what you are able to make now, you know, the fact that you have much more access to technology. So I definitely, you know, agree with you that if there was a way that you can take all of these uh, podcasts that you do and make it available and known by people going through school, you know, so that they have the opportunity to listen and hear you know, what different careers are like, you know, what is a computer internet developer career like? What is a biotech starter like Derek, you know, is like, you know, what is a academic physician scientist like myself is like, I think that really opens up a lot the doors to people who may not even have thought of these careers, you know, from the beginning. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Wu, for being part of this episode and giving me the opportunity to interview you so people can get to know more about your insights into just cardiology and your research. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, thank you so much. You know, this is a really great and a lot of fun, you know, to talk about these issues. And you know, I definitely uh, look forward to see when you got it put together and uh, hope that, you know, mm-hmm. other people will find it interesting as well. Thank you. Oh,